there. Julie Lancel here from the Pacifica Historical Society and tonight's host of the show, Footprints of Pacifica, the History of Valimar. Footprints of Pacifica is the show where we get together to discover and explore the lore and the lore of lovely Pacifica, its character and its characters. Tonight's topic is Valimar, its history and its charm. I moved to Pacifica with my husband almost 30 years ago. We were living in San Francisco, renting a, a small home there, and we were about to start our family, and we really wanted to find a house of our own that we could buy and afford. We had friends in Montera, and we would drive to see them every once in a while, and we always passed through Pacifica. On one of those trips, we decided to turn in to uh, the first traffic light that we came to when we were in Pacifica, and that was Reina del Mar, and we turned into Valimar to just see what the homes were like there. We were awestruck. It was so beautiful. I have a photograph here of what it looked like at that time. The trees, the Monterey pines, the eucalyptus, the palm trees, were so grand and beautiful. It was truly an amazing place. After a year or two, we were able to find a home and we moved into Pacifica and uh, we've been very happy here all that time. It's a wonderful community and we're so pleased to be here. Recently, we had the opportunity here at the Historical Society to meet a des descendant of the Timictac Band of Ohlone Indians who met with resident historian Shirley Dry at the Sanchez Adobe. And this is where the history of Pacifica, and in particular Valimar, begins. I'm Julie Lancel, and I'm here today with Dr. Jonathan Cordero. He's a descendant of the original Native Americans who lived in in this in Pacifica, but in particular the Quarry area and uh, the Valimar area, the Tamigtec tribe. So, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming today. I'm happy to, to be a part of uh, you know anything that's happening today. Um, I've been very welcomed by people of Pacifica, so that's been very pleasant, and it's good. It's a good turnout. It so is. So I'm happy to be here. Yeah. It is. The the Park Service is here. Uh, the GGNRA, we're here from the Historical Society. We're just really thrilled to have Jonathan with us today, and thank you so much for You're coming. You're welcome, yeah. This is us right here, not somebody uh, I'm Shirley Dry. I live here in Pacific and have for 55 years, and I'm an archaeologist, a uh, California archaeologist. I have to make that clear. All my excavation has been in, Cal in Central California, and it has been of the native population Locally, we, it is the, the Ohlone, and I've done mission archaeology, but the, dear to my heart is, is the Ohlone people. And visiting us today is Dr. Jonathan Cordero from uh, California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks. Thousand Oaks in Southern California, who, to my delight and surprise, contacted me by email to tell me he was coming up. And the exciting part about this is that he is a descendant of people at the Timigtac village site. Our village site here at the Sanchez Adobe is Puristac. And my understanding is that TAC is like a locator, mm -hmm. like saying Kansas yeah. City or something like that. And um, Timigtac is the quarry lands, which all of us who live here know where that is. And I was involved in some of the archaeology there and have uh, artifacts from Tamigtac, which would be his ancestral home. And I'm so, we're all thrilled about having Jonathan here because it's the first time we've had anyone from our villages who was a descendant of the Ohlone people here ever visited. We've always, I know so many Ohlone people, but none of them count their descendancy from Pacifica. Now we have one. So when I was doing my research, I recreated all of the families and then all of the villages on the San Francisco Peninsula and then uh, charted their uh, marital 
or their marriages at Mission Dolores. And what I noticed was that, um, what, I, what I, I should say, what I came to find was that this village here at Puristak and the headman here, based on who his children married, was the most prominent political headman on the entire San Francisco Peninsula. And so his children married the children of headmen at other villages more than any other in the San Francisco Peninsula. And it was really remarkable. In fact, his, the sort of second person in charge at this village married his daughter. And it was very uncommon for a person in a village to marry the daughter of another family that was also in the village. So his children married in all of those other families, but married primarily the children of headmen. And no, no other headman had that many marriages of children to other headmen. So that indicated to me that this person was numero uno, uno in terms of the political landscape in, uh, you know, in, in the San Francisco Peninsula. So I thought that was really fascinating. So when their children went to Mission Dolores and were incorporated into Mission Dolores, they became the most prominent members of the mission staff. And the project that Ben and I are working on is trying to figure out who were the people who most likely painted the, the mural at Mission Dolores, and it would have most likely been the most prominent staff people who would have most likely been the most prominent indigenous people. And so there's a really nice link there. Uh, so t I think three of the people from this tribe accounted for about 50% of all the witnessing uh, at marriages at Mission Dolores, and that's phenomenal for three people to do, you know, roughly 50% of it up to until about 1800. Uh, I'm not sure the numbers are right, but it's something like that. It's really significant. The title of my article is Native Persistence. So in other words, the social structure, uh, the social and political organization of the Ohlone people in the San Francisco Peninsula persisted through the mission period, which contradicts the common understanding that people have that once the Indians were brought to the mission, the Spanish changed everything. And that's not even close to being true. We know that there's more and more research that shows that the missions did not have a significant impact, as significant an impact on indigenous societies as we had previously thought. And this article shows that their, their social structure remained in place through the entire period. For example, if, uh, if, if uh, the women died more than the men. So if, if a spouse died, if an Ohlone spouse died from the peninsula, typically almost 90% you know, of the time, or over 90% of the time, he would marry another Ohlone spouse another Ohlone woman, I'm sorry, and, and keep it sort of within the family. So they had this sort of, sort of regional or political pact to retain their, uh, their political power. And they were the dominant group at the mission through, uh, through at least the early 1800s. My, my Spanish ancestors, the Cordero family, they were the first couple ever married at Mission Dolores. We're on what we call the quarry lands. And this is on the west side of 101 at Valimar, which is a, a subdivision of Pacifica. And uh, the site here was uh, home to a group of native Californians that were called the Ohlone. And we're probably standing on, close to standing on top of what was a village site. And Jonathan Cordero here, standing beside me, is a descendant of the people who were here. And their village was Tamigtak. And J Jonathan, you want to? Sure. It was, it was more or less just that family. It was a fairly large family and their grandkids. Um, and it was the smallest of the Ohlone villages on the San Francisco Peninsula. Um, and it's remarkable that the one surviving lineage from the San Francisco Peninsula came from the smallest village. Yeah, so I can trace my family's lineage back to the early 1700s. Um, and. Uh, Two, two generations born here at this village, and then another two generations uh, born at Mission Dolores in San Francisco. I, I was coming here, I was thinking, you know, where would this have been situated? Because it's closer to the ocean than a lot of them oh, okay. were. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, different than the city. But because, yeah, but because the mountains are here, they would prevent the cold air and the wind and the yeah. the fog. Yeah. And the weather, too, is, um, it makes sense that they might, I know living in Valamar, it's, the weather can be, you know, rather inclement here with the fog and everything, but you go just a short distance into the valley and then it opens up and it's, you know, it's, it's much more pleasant. And of course, the site over by Sanchez Adobe is very sunny there. Yeah, beautiful. And this could have been a seasonal village here, right? Mm -hmm. And not, 
and not clear. I don't know. There's so too much midden for it to be that. That so? midden was enormous. Yeah, but over the years? Yeah, they came back years. to the same spot over the years? Well, yeah, I do think that, but I don't think this is that inconsequential. Yeah. Maybe it was. If so you're implying, mm -hmm. though, that that this berm was put on top of the resource. Yeah. That the resource remains. I know absolutely below. that that was and the that case. That is in this area here, where where those. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, the, well, where I the stuff I collected would have been over there. Well, it says that there's a big midden right down there. Yeah. And that it needs to be protected, and then the the site needs to be reorganized so that it doesn't damage. It. This is the site then of my ancestral homeland that goes back thousands of years. So. I think they lived up and down the valley. You know, yeah. you heard me say that if their, uh, their refuse piles got too smelly and bug infested that they would burn down their house and move. So I think that they probably, you know, within a uh, limited distance, just like in our valley, all they had to do was move back a few dozen yards and then back further. And then they could come back up to where they had first been, you know? And I think the same thing was here. If you want to go look at Valley Mar, do so. Years ago, 115 years ago, there weren't all these trees in, in Valley Mar. It was a grassland, and with the exception of a, a couple of homes, it was just vacant grassland all the way down to the uh, what we now call the quarry. Um, we imagine that for the Native Americans, since they did, we, are, we do know that they did use the quarry as a site uh, and for occupation for their small band, they probably came up this valley on a regular basis. I mean, obviously to access the, the creek, the fish, uh, the deer, the rabbit, things that, that uh, thrived in this grassland. We're, right now we're standing at the top of Dardanelle, which is on the north side of Valimar. Um, it's a great spot to be able to look down to see the valley below, and it's a very beautiful day. And it's very quiet back here. The trees weren't planted until the early 1900s when George Rich purchased this property and wanted to develop it into home sites for people to come and stay in uh, when the Ocean Shore Railroad uh, came through. They were like vacation cottages. I believe there were only uh, 20, he was encouraging people to buy them to have a vacation cottage on the Ocean Shore Railroad near the ocean. Right now we're standing in front of the home that was originally built by Angelo Pendola, father of Loretta Gust, or Loretta Pendola Gust, the, the wife of Nick Gust. Um, the home was built in the 1920s and they had originally moved here and were growing flowers and lived in a much smaller house, a farmhouse. And then Angelo built this home for his family. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's just at a, in a beautiful location right near the creek and a perfect spot for them to access uh, the flowers that they grew back here and sold in San Francisco. Lorraine has many, many s stories uh, that she recounts in the, the uh, Gust family history um, about getting up very early in the morning and tying together uh, bundles of flowers so that they could be taken into town by Angelo to be uh, sold at the flower market. It must have been just an extraordinary place. It still is, but it must have been really, really beautiful uh, at that time. Uh, just a, a beautiful place to live and grow up in. Right now we're across the street from a house, but if you look closely the garage there once was the site of the Volunteer Valimar Fire Department. And it was all volunteer in Valimar until 1953. And this was the firehouse. Right now we're coming up to a couple of beautiful old redwoods that were planted probably before even the Monterey Pines were planted. They're just beautiful. The redwoods are a better choice simply because they have a much longer lifespan than the Monterey Pine, which really is 80 to 90 years it reaches its, uh, the end of its life. Throughout Valimar, you will see a number of palm trees. The first ones were planted originally by George Rich, who thought it would add the kind of vacation atmosphere to the, uh, 
Valimar vacation cabin concept that he was uh, advertising here. Right now we're, we're approaching the uh, what's known as the Y in Valimar. You can get to the back of the valley by taking one or other of these two roads. I had a rather exciting adventure here um, in 1993 with the big storms that uh, eventually damaged a great deal of the Bay Area. On this particular night, the storm had just come in. The wind was howling. The trees were swaying back and forth. I just returned from a particularly contentious council meeting, and I didn't know which way to go. Should I take this side or that side? The wind was blowing so severely that I sincerely thought my life might be in jeopardy. I ended up taking the road on the left and zoomed home, made it home safely. But the next morning when I woke up, I took a walk through the valley and three of the giant uh, Monterey Pines had fallen. One of them on a home uh, and cut right through the middle of it. And then two others, one went across the road, which is the road not taken that night, and uh, the other one through the side yard of a home. And that was the, really the beginning of the end of the Monterey Pines in Valimar. It was unfortunate because it was like the avenue of the giants when you drove through. It was just extraordinarily beautiful. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the trees had to be taken out. They, the lifespan was uh, about 80 plus years and they had been here that long. So, but that was quite an adventure that night when I hope not to repeat uh, after the storms of 93, a community group came together, the Valimar Conservators, and they planted a number of native trees, including across the street we see a, a buckeye, I believe that is. But it, as you go through Valimar, you'll see trees that are about, right now I guess they're almost 25 years old. And a variety of native trees were planted here that are doing very well, and we're so f grateful to the Valimar Conservancy and Nancy, and Nancy Hall and Andrew Leone, who were the originators of that movement, and really made a difference and helped the community move ahead on revegetating and planting more trees here in, in the valley. And uh, we're so grateful for them. It was a healing process for all of us because it was devastating to see all those pine trees taken out. It really made it, really changed it a lot. Well, welcome back to the studio. Um, after we made that video, I did search out some photographs from that storm that I was describing, and uh, I wanted to just share them with you. Uh, that this, this first one shows the, the Monterey Pine that went through the side of one of the homes in Valimar. As you can see, it just went right through the middle of the house. Fortunately, no one was injured in that. Most of the family was out on a ski trip and the one person who was there was reading and uh, was not injured, thank goodness. And uh, this one is another picture of uh, one of the other homes that was uh, damaged uh, in, that, in that storm. I, as I mentioned uh, in the video that you just saw, uh, the community came together, a group of, of residents in Valimar, Nancy, Nancy Hall and Andrew Leone and others, to form the Valimar, Conserv the Valimar Conservators Organization. So two, two uh, in, in uh, it was several years later, uh, the, they formed, the, well, after forming the Valimar Conservators, they decided to celebrate Arbor Day in Valimar with a, a community-wide tree planting which also uh, and kicked off with a wonderful parade. And the Pacifica Tribune had a picture of, of the parade. And this is, this is the picture that appeared in the, the and it was, it was just lovely. It was very naturalistic and there was a giant puppet and there were lots of kids walking, school children, and there was singing and, and tree planting. And it was uh, kind of a wonderful healing uh, for all of us. And it was really wonderful what they started there in Valimar to give us something to do to remedy, you know, 
the results of the, the disaster that struck. So um, this evening, I also wanted to just read from uh, a book that was prepared by the Gust family. Uh, many of you know uh, they've been residents for a century uh, in Pacifica, or in the, I think it's a century, I'm not sure, but close. Um, anyway, there's a book that the Gus family put together called 80 Years at Rockaway Beach, A Gus Family History. Now, some of you may not know that um, Lorraine Gust was actually the daughter of the Pendola family, which were one of the first families to settle in Valimar and uh, to uh, cultivate what were beautiful flowers, which I mentioned actually in the earlier part of the show. But I'm going to just read to you from it because it provides certain parts of the history that I wasn't able to cover earlier. And here's what the book says in telling the story about uh, Lorraine uh, Pendola's father. Valimar was a tiny settlement developed out of the former artichoke fields and grazing lands of Maury Ranch that a man named George O. Rich, and you've heard his name earlier, he was the fellow who purchased Valimar to, to create all the home sites. Rich was born in Palo Alto and had already proven the promise of his name by making a fortune dealing heavy machinery to the booming Alaska to Nevada mining industry from his base in Los Angeles. Yet, when he set out to convert his wealth into real estate on the northern coast, he tempered his ambitions for Valimar with a poetic vision. To entice people from the crowded cities and hot inland valleys to buy a piece of this hidden paradise, Rich created a garden oasis that people later compared to Golden Gate Park. He shipped a variety of trees, Monterey cypress, pine, blue gum eucalyptus, redwoods, blackwood acacias, and a stately row of Canary Island palms that would flank the sides of the entry road. Uh, Liz Thoride, in her uh, comments at one of the Historical Society's meetings in the 90s, said that he, he imported the canary palms from Los Angeles, and he, uh, uh, meanwhile, he, he brought in trees from Santa Cruz, the redwoods and the Monterey pines. And this was, he, he really wanted to have tree, plant trees there that uh, were proven to do well in, in this kind of environment, a coastal environment. Um, it, it, we talk, it, the, the story tells a little bit about the construction in Valimar and what happened is that once the Ocean Shore Railroad did not succeed, uh, the, the sale of lots became very sluggish, but George Rich was the same, at the same time ceding his money in similar housing developments uh, to the south of Devil's Slide, so he was successful. Uh, and Claude Rich, who was his son, ran both those projects. And uh, so he had a booming lumber yard and everything went well for him. But meanwhile, Lorraine's father, Angelo Pendola, heard of the development in Valimar while living in Moss Beach. And he liked Claude Rich and he liked the idea of a place that was not crowded and not likely to develop too fast. Fed as it was by a creek that carried mountain spring water to the fields year round, Angelo imagined Valimar was a virtual paradise, a place where he could realize his own personal dreams of happiness, which was the raising of flowers. The Pendolas rented one of only three houses that were already there in Valimar at the time there, at that time, and that was 1927. It was a small and charming home along Clara Creek which is where they began their business and where they grew flowers um, on many, many acres. And uh, Lorraine in this, in this memoir talks about how she'd, she'd help gather them together with her sister and then they would go to the, the uh, farmer's market in San Francisco daily. So I think that that's gonna have to be it for this evening. But as I mentioned before, George Rich also built the Valimar Station, and that site has a fascinating history as well, and is a great place to visit. 
it is filled with historic photos and displays. But we'll have to save that trip for another day. Thank you for watching.